Welcome, everybody. My name is Ben Piccini. This is Radical Civility, and I am thrilled to have with me Marion Edmonds Allen. Um, and why don't I, I, before I get anything wrong, why don't I actually let you introduce yourself and tell us as much about your story as you would like? And then I'm excited to talk today about covenantal pluralism and what that means and why I think it's a, a really beautiful and important concept. Oh, well, Ben, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I am thrilled to be here and I'm thrilled to meet you. I, I am a fan. Um, my background is actually kind of a, a strange one. I, the, the short version of it that has to do with LGBT and faith is I grew up evangelical, always was a church nerd, wanted to go to church and would beg my parents to take me to town and drop me off at a church. So I grew up going to all different kinds of churches. And then I went to a Christian evangelical college and got married very young. I was 20 and um, married my first boyfriend and we had four children and I was busy in the church. I ran the church Sunday school and, you know, did all that kind of stuff and loved it. And then fast forward 15 years, um, my husband decided he wanted to, to move on. And so I became a single mom with four kids. And my pastor said, have you thought about going to seminary to become a pastor? It seems like you might have those gifts. And I was excited about that because when I was a teenager, I had I had felt a call to ministry, which is the way we, we talk about that. And so I thought, well, gosh, you know, I do, I've been a stay at home mom and I need a profession and I'd love to do that. So yes, so I, I started the very long trek to becoming an ordained minister. It, it takes many, many years and it's a beautiful journey. And towards the end of this journey, gosh, it must've been about seven years in, I was about at the end getting ready to be ordained, getting ready to graduate. And I was working as a chaplain in a hospital and I met my very first LGBT person. So picture this 40 years old, to my knowledge, I had never met an LGBT person before. And, and here was one. So I, I'll be very honest and say, I experienced homophobic feelings. I was very unnerved by this and actually very put off by it and thought, oh, you know, why in my program, you know, why is this happening? And then I thought, okay, I'm going to be a minister. I need to learn how to relate to everyone. So I'm going to lean into this circumstance and I'm going to get to know what I called these people. Well, you know, it's the, it's the ugly duckling story. We all know how this ends, right? <laughs> so I, I figured out over the period of a few months that this was who I was too. I had no idea. And honestly, I say that with 100% honesty. Growing up in rural Maine and in, in an evangelical context, to my knowledge, I'd never met an LGBT person and was really sheltered. That wasn't something, a topic I ever encountered in the media. So this was a surprise to me. I'd kind of heard it preached in church, but, but that was the extent of it. So I entered into, into a time of real spiritual wrestling, thinking, well, I can't be LGBT and I can't be a person of faith. I certainly can't be a minister. Absolutely not. So I went back to my advisor at my seminary and explained the situation. And my advisor, first of all, argued with me and said, well, of course you're not, that can't be true. And so we talked through it and I said, well, you know, it is true. I've, I've been wrestling with it and I've come to believe that it's true. What should I do? I'm, should I be ordained? Should I not? I was coming up on my senior theology exam, which means there are 200 people in a room that can ask you anything and decide whether or not you're fit to be ordained. And I was worried someone would ask the question, are you LGBT or how do you feel about that or, or something? And my advisor said, well, if someone asks you that question, then I suggest you lie. So I, I thought about that because picture me, I'm a single mom of four kids. I've been on this seven year journey with all the student loans, with working full time, being a full time mom, with going to school full time. It's been a lot. And I'm at the end. I could just lie if someone asked the question. But I, I decided I couldn't I couldn't do that. So I withdrew from seminary and I worked full time as a chaplain until I realized there are other seminaries that wanted people like me who are LGBT to be 
to receive theological education from them. So I went to a different theological school, finished my Master of Divinity degree, was ordained, and became a church planter, moved to Salt Lake City, started a church, started working with youth experiencing homelessness, and then got very involved with LGBT ministry. I started running an LGBT youth center while I was running the church at the same time. And then the youth center grew from 17 youth to 700 youth, and I couldn't do the church as well. So I switched to LGBT work full time until I ended up at Parity, which is a perfect spot for me. So Parity is a nonprofit based in Manhattan, and it works at the intersection of faith and LGBT. So finally, after all these years, I can bring together the LGBT part of myself that I never knew I had, and the faith part of myself, which I always knew I had. And I describe it as my LGBT self really makes my faith self better, and my faith self makes my LGBT self better. So it's, it's a beautiful life that I'm blessed to live. What an incredible, incredible story. I, I mean, I have so many thoughts as you're talking. Well, one of them is that I feel immediate kinship to another church nerd. I mean, I was, I was the kid growing up who had all the, you know, I was memorizing hymns and, you know, I loved all of that kind of stuff. And, and that was fantastic. Um, I also appreciate how you started the conversation with vulnerability about some of the feelings you felt towards someone when you first met someone who was LGBT. Um, I, I was talking with a friend of mine and just mentioned, you know, I think Twitter is such a terrible place in part because there's no grace. There's no way to, to say I'm sorry and to fix things. And I think one of the things that is really powerful about modeling, hey, I, I did something imperfect and I learned from it and I grew from it and I'm trying more now. Um, I just, I appreciate that tremendously. Well, uh, one of the things that I wanna to talk to you about is this article you wrote for Public Square Magazine um, with which I am completely enthralled um, and I'm, I'm trying to recommend to anybody I can get, get, uh, get it into their hands. Um, you, you open with this question that has been really striking to me. As an LGBT person, why bother with religious liberty? Um, and I think that's a really profound, interesting question. And, and the short answer is read the article, people. Um, but the, the, give me the, the kind of the intermediate version real quick. <laughs> well, it's that question kind of stops the conversation wherever I am, because for folks who are LGBT, the, the words religious liberty, religious freedom, I mean, them's fighting words, right? Like, okay, well, that religious freedom is shorthand for discrimination. Everyone knows that, right? And I'm saying, wait a minute. And then on, on the other side of that, faith folks who aren't LGBT, they see, and I would say rightly so, they see LGBT folks as trying to take away their religious freedom. Mm. So for faith folks, the idea of LGBT people is another, oh, you know, not them's fighting words, but more, oh, I need to be really cautious now. I need to be really worried about what, what might come next. But what I see instead, and this is due to a couple of things, it's due to my, my experiences here in Utah and the people I've met in Utah, the people who worked on the Utah Compromise, the, my friends and colleagues who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ have had a huge influence on me, as well as seeing how things can really be improved for LGBT folks by leaning into religious freedom. So if we just take Utah as one example, since the Utah Compromise was passed, things are, it's like night and day. I'm someone who, who, as we just talked about, has worked with youth for so many years. And I have seen youth in the depths of despair. I, every single youth I worked with when I was running the center knew someone who had lost their life to suicide. One out of every three youth was actively experiencing homelessness that came to our center. So, I mean, terrible circumstances. But things have changed in amazing ways since LGBT folks and faith folks work together to ensure religious freedoms in Utah, and at the same time, ensuring dignity for LGBT folks. That means now that LGBT youth and adults and their families, it's very different. So when someone comes out to a family, it's not, oh no, do I need to kick the kid out? Maybe my religious leader says I should. 
Instead, what I hear is, how can I help foster my child's faith? I support that they're LGBT. It's not part of our faith as a family. However, I want them to have a relationship with God, or I want them to be successful in life. <clears throat> How can I help this child to succeed? So it's a very different world, and it's all because of LGBT and religious freedom. Fabulous answer. I, I love that. Yeah. Oh, that's that's my little guy here. He's he's found an eraser for a pencil, and it has become a monster, and he is roaring like a monster. Um, <laughs> I, I grew up in Salt Lake City and uh, I can still remember the, the compromise. And I remember, um, you know, that not everybody was happy on both sides. And yet I felt at the time, and th this is hard for me to get out to people sometimes, you know, some people say, well, you, you believe in civility, but that's just weak centrism. And it's like, mm, no, I don't think so. Actually, I think it is principled. But I also think that if the if, if by centrism you mean somewhere in between the extremes or that it has to be all my way or nothing, yeah, yeah, there, there is a, a, an amount of, of centrism and thinking about it deliberately and, and trying to be careful. Um, I also think about the Utah Compact on Immigration, which um, I, I studied you know, economics and immigration and it's such a powerful, you know, it's, it's, it's very important to me. Um, I thought for a long time that that's something that, uh, that was positive where we were able, you know, that I shouldn't say we, the church kind of released a statement saying there's some principles here that are really important and, 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 and figuring out a good immigration system is very complicated. And we recognize that. And at the same time, keeping families together and, and recognizing that they have rights and giving them dignity. Those are things that should not be about, um, you know, culture war battles and turf, and turf wars and things like that. Well, let me ask you a little bit. You, you mentioned in the, in the article that countries with the strongest LGBT protections are also the ones with the strongest religious freedom protections. I find that absolutely fascinating. And I want to kind of peer inside your brain. Why do you think that is? What, what's going on there? Well, and thanks to my colleague and friend, Dr. Brian Grimm for that research. It's, you know, that too is, is counterintuitive because it goes back to the argument of, oh, religious freedom is against LGBT rights and all that. But actually, if you have a more um, civil society where people of all ideas and perspectives, religious beliefs and non-belief are treated equally, then that means that you will have more LGBT rights. And that means that you will have more religious freedom. And that's why to me, this concept of covenantal pluralism, which is what it's all based in is, is so important. And I'm surprised that it's not something that everyone's talking about because when I first heard about it, and I will say right up front that I am, I am learning about this. I am not the expert yet. I'm in a doctor of ministry program and I'm working hard at it. But to me, this is a game changer and I'm seeing it happen in play out in real time. I'm part of an international religious freedom roundtable group, which is different roundtables from all over the world. And they operate under the principles of covenantal pluralism. And I see very different people advocate for the human dignity of others. People that you would think wouldn't ever get along, wanna to talk to each other. They are actively trying to help each other. And to me, this is a way that our world can change in beautiful ways. Okay, so I, I, I want to, the rest of my questions were all about covenantal pluralism. So I wanna dig into this. I, I was raised on the idea of pluralism, right? The idea of you do what you want and I do what I want, live and let live. You know, we kind of all have our separate paths. There's an element here of this, but I agree with you. We were, we were talking before, before I started recording and I just said, I really believe that this is key. This is not minor. This is so, so, so big. The idea that we can be, I, I think I saw it on one of those, those, uh, those ads. We recently had general conference and in between they always play the, 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 the TV spots. And, and one of them was we can be, um, we can be one, even though I, I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was, we can be different and still be one, you know, something like that. And I really like that idea. So help me understand what is covenantal pluralism and how is it different from just regular old pluralism? Well, the pl regular old pluralism and covenantal pluralism are very similar. The covenantal part is the standing up for each other, the active advocating for each other. So instead of live and let live, it's how can I help you not only live, but to flourish, not 
despite our differences of belief or non-belief, but because of them, because of who I am as a, as a faith person personally, then I would advocate for someone else's human flourishing and dignity, no matter their belief system or non-belief. That's the covenantal part. It's absolutely fantastic. And well, and, and, and I'm probably reading into this more because I'm definitely, I learned this from you and you say you're still learning. So now I'm realizing how much I have to learn about this. And yet when you said that, the thought that came to my mind is, you know, I have dear, dear friends of other faiths. I have friends of, um, you know, it, it was interesting. When I was growing up, I lived in Italy for a few years and it was a beautiful experience. But while I was in Italy, I was at an, at an, at an international school um, with students from all over the world, different faiths, different backgrounds. And one of the things that came very naturally was to see I'm not the most important person here. There are other people with stories and their stories are valuable. And so that kind of regular old pluralism was, was kind of automatic. I think what I'm seeing now um, when I think of covenantal pluralism, it's to see my Catholic friend in Rome going to mass and to think of that as something holy and sacred that it deserves for me to stand up for, even if I don't share the same belief, right? To say, hey, what they are doing is beautiful and important. Um, and I really do think it extends not just to other faiths, but also into people who disagree with me on all sorts of different things, whether it's politics or LGBT issues or, or what have you. Um, have you. Give me an example, if, if you have one, where do you see this actually making changes in the world today? And, 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 and also, where can people go to learn more about this and how to apply it? <laughs> well, I'm seeing it most actively now in the religious freedom world, actually. And I, I had been kind of sensing all along that religious freedom was the key to healing the LGBT and faith divide. But it was covenantal pluralism that was the aha moment for me. And the, the organization that has the deepest roots and the most active engagement with it that I am seeing is the Templeton Foundation. So that would be the place to go to learn more. And, and there, is, there is a body of scholarship there that someone can dig into. And what I'm also doing is I'm looking at the more ancient roots of covenantal pluralism, which is within the Jewish faith, which I find fascinating. So I'm learning about that as well. But I think we see covenantal pluralism all around us. I think if we each look in at our lives, if we think about, okay, who's an unexpected friend that I have? That's covenantal pluralism right there. Because if, so say you have a friend that you don't agree with on everything, or you're a different faith, a different political party, whatever it might be. Still, if your friend called you and said, hey, my car broke down, would you help me? Of course you would. And that, that doesn't mean that your friend or you need to change your political or religious affiliation or change your mind on any hot topic issue. No, no, you are there to help each other and you have very different beliefs and ideas. That's covenantal pluralism. So on a small scale, we all do it, but then on a larger scale, it's, it's changing the world through religious freedom. That's fantastic. And one of, one of the things that I'm hearing and what you're saying and, um, is that it, it, it almost forces you to see other people as people rather than as threats, right? You, you spoke earlier about, oh, I'm a person of faith and I see somebody who's LGBT. I imagine it instantly, oh, well, you know, that, that person is a threat to me. They're going to challenge my way of life or, or what I hold sacred. And at the same time, and I think you said this perfectly, I've raised the issue of religious freedom before and been told we all know that that's code for discrimination. And it's so hard because it's like, no, that's not actually how I feel about it. And, and if it were, then I would oppose it, right? That there are some very serious, you know, let's, let's get into this, let's, let's engage more. Um, I, I, I've been kind of tinkering around with an idea in my head. I, I, uh, I wanna write eventually a piece about how, um, what happens when trust breaks down. And, uh, you know, we, we see these zombie movies and the apocalypse movies and all of this. And I think the, the one that actually keeps me up most is what happens when trust breaks down in society, when we don't see each other as people, when we're threats. And fortunately, we have a real life example and we call it Twitter, um, because as soon as you get out there and you say something, and I, I apologize for, for, for knocking on Twitter so much during our conversation. Um, when you get out there, you realize that everybody's kind of got their fist balled up to begin with, right? Everybody's ready to fight or to say that clever, but devastating thing. And um, they're not actually there to see other people as human being. To me, the core of engagement, the core of civility is to say, you are a human being first. And because of that, I want to learn from you and engage with you. No matter what else happens, that is the place where I want to start. 
I completely agree. And I, I think part of the problem with Twitter is the fact that it feels so anonymous. I mean, you know, we know who um, we're tweeting at, at, you know, at some points for having that type of conversation, but we're not, we're not looking at each other. And we're not you know, perhaps in the in the same room where, where we can really get a sense of each other. Instead, it's this anonymous, I'm going to hurl an insult and I hope it's so devastatingly funny that it gets retweeted thousands of times and, you know, and all that. So we, we lose our humanity in that type of engagement. And I also think that we were losing our best allies because think about it. If say you and I are on different sides of a, of a particular issue, whatever it might be, if we can come together and, and have a conversation about it, and I can listen with curiosity to you and hear your ideas about an issue, and then you listen with the same curiosity to with what I have to say about it, then together, perhaps we could come up with a solution that can help the, the entire world, because what's a better team than two people on opposite sides who then come together to try to figure something out. And, and we're missing that on Twitter when we're just hurling snowballs at each other rather than engaging in true dialogue. I think that's spot on. I, you know, it's funny. I, part of what always strikes me is that you've got the two camps and they've got their two different goals. And then when you look at it, you can go like this and see how much of it is actually a Venn diagram. And there's this big section in the middle that we should all be able to agree on but we've all kind of driven in our stakes and saying no, because that would be compromise. And it's like, okay, but we both agree on this. Um, I wrote an article recently that was meant to be a, a, a kind of a take on, okay, there, there are clearly things that are separate and that's okay. But what are the things that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a BYU-Idaho faculty. What are the things that my faith compels me to do to stand up for my LGBT students? And also that don't take anything away from my convictions about um, you know, what we believe about family and everything else like that. And I think, I think thinking in that framework helped me a lot to say, not only is this okay for me to say, but it's kind of required, you know, to be a Christian means that I stand up for others and that I, I look after their well-being and their welfare. Um, and so that, I, I really like that framing. I think that that's, that's exactly right. Um, I was going to say something else, but now I can't remember what it is. So I'm going to transition to this instead. Um, you said in the article, when there is energy, there is potential. And there is, what, what a fabulous, so let me, let me start with, um, the, the older I get, the more I realize that uh, a lot of the, the tricks and tips you learn, and you know, I, I kind of expected cognitive behavioral therapy to be this, this place where you have to marinate in it for years and years and years, and then slowly you start to change. And in fact, a lot of the time it's like, here's one gem. And if you apply this regularly, it'll change your whole life. And one of them to me is reframe obstacles as possibilities, right? Reframe setbacks as learning opportunities. Um, and I, I view this the same way where there is energy and you didn't even say negative energy, right? Where there is energy around a topic, that means there is also potential. Um, when I see, I can think of a number of issues around which there is energy. Um, I would love your thoughts on that and how you've applied that. Um, I, I can think of six or seven different things that I now want to go and run and do because I see the energy and the potential around those, those causes and those issues. Um, and even if all it is, is, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to rant for, for another second longer. My, my wife is an audiologist. She told me this very interesting study recently, and it, it goes like this. You have, you have a group of people who are called malingerers, right? Who fake a, a disability in order to get benefits or something like that. If you actually look at the number, it's very, very small. There are a few, but it's pretty rare. What you have in between though, is you have a, a group between people who are completely healthy and, and the malingerers down here. You have a group of people who claim that they have a, a, a symptom or something wrong. And then when you listen to them and you empathize with them, often all of this goes away. And they, they start to feel heard all of a sudden. And so one of the examples she gave was their hearing has in fact changed, but it hasn't changed to the point where they need any kind of medical intervention. They just need somebody to say, yeah, it looks like it has changed. That must be really frustrating. And now instead of saying, no doc, it's changed. It's really significant. You don't understand. They go, oh, okay. They are hearing me. They're understanding me. And all of a sudden those people in the middle can say, you know what? I probably don't need medical intervention but I've been heard today. So anyway, that's, that's my, my quick rant about, about empathy and hearing other people. But what are your thoughts on, on uh, energy and potential? Well, you, you went right to, the, right to the heart of it, which is listening to other people is the key 
to harnessing the energy and and changing the world. So if there is someone, so for example, when I was running the LGBT center, one time we had a public event that was about bullying. There was a new law in the state of Utah about notifying parents if a child was bullied. And that seems like a great law, except there weren't parameters around it. And I was worried that youth would get outed and then perhaps get kicked out of the family home. So we had a public event and we talked about the law. And the next morning I had a phone call from the legislator, Gage Frower, and he said, well, you don't like my law, do you? And I said, well, <laughs> he said, well, come to my office, let's talk about it. And I was so taken aback by that, that I said, well, yes, I, I will. And off I went and I was a little nervous about it. And it, it was Gage and two of his associates and we debated about whether or not there were homeless youth in Utah was what finally happened. I explained to him why this was worrying in my opinion. And one of his aides said, well, I, you know, I just can't believe that th there would be homeless youth in Utah, but I could come to your center. And I said, please do then, please come to the center and you can, you can meet someone. And by golly, she did, Laura came to the center and while she was there, she met a 12-year-old boy experiencing homelessness who was gathering supplies to take back to his homeless youth family, because homeless youth always organize in families of about 10 or so, and they take care of each other. So she got to know him and then got to realize, oh, there are homeless youth in Utah. I just met one. And then Laura, because of who she was as a legislative aide, could go back to Gage and then ended up changing the laws. At that time, you couldn't shelter a youth experiencing homelessness. So that 12-year-old boy that I would see, there, was, there wasn't any place that I could send him to, to get shelter. So because of that energy that, oh, I see what you're saying, I disagree with it, but let's talk about it then turned into Laura and I actively working together and, and becoming really good friends, but working together to change the laws in the state and then working together to tackle youth suicide. And Laura is still an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ, and I am still LGBT. And there are things that we really don't agree on at all. And yet we're dear friends and we are an unstoppable partnership because she knows one side of it, I know the other side, and together, watch out world. I love that. That's fantastic. Um, and it's it's kind of fun to see. I mean, I was, I was, I think I was living in Salt Lake at the time when all of this was happening. And I remember thinking, you know, if you, when you hear a press release that something has gotten through that has been thoughtful and accepted by both sides, there are people behind the scenes who are making it happen, who are building bridges, who are communicating, who are getting along. Um, and I, you know, I remember thinking I would love to meet some of them someday. And so it's an honor to, to actually get to. Um, well, with that, I, I, we were talking about a couple of things before the show, and I wanted to, to, to kind of turn it to you to ask me any questions that you have for me real quick. <laughs> well, I am dying to hear your thoughts on covenantal pluralism. I mean, what, what are the implications that you see? How, did, how are things coming together around that? What have you seen in the world? I, I'm so curious your thoughts. Well, I, I, I am so excited about it in, in part because I think it really is key to solving some of the divides that we see. Um, and I'll, I'll give you, I, I hope that this isn't too, too cynical, but um, I think part of the problem is that our, our politics have infected even religion, right? That everything has become a zero sum, one person wins and the other person loses. And that's a really, you know, th there are times when we have to solve things democratically and I recognize that. Um, but fundamentally, once you get 51% of the votes, it, the, other, the other side is, is going to lose their proposition. And uh, one of the things that I'm seeing from this is that might sometimes be necessary. We need to have those out. And yet most of the best bills, are the ones that are supported by 80% of people anyway, right? It's the ones that everybody says, okay, this makes sense. I feel good about this. We've, we've built a broad coalition. We've come together and done this. Um, I think the other thing to me is to, to view other people's commitments as sacred, right? And whether that is, you know, I, I mentioned before, I had Catholic friends when I was in Italy growing up and, and seeing them trot off to mass and not saying, oh, they're going to do their thing, but saying there's something holy in what they are doing that deserves defense, right? And if they are going to go and do that, and it's not just as a transaction, but so that it's, and I hope that they stand up for me someday, it's, it's recognizing that there is actually some holiness there, that there is something sacred and beautiful. Um, 
President Oaks is, is a, a member of the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ and um, just gave a talk that I found really compelling where he said, we're worried about church attendance. And I thought, okay, well, that's, that's not for me to worry about because I'm attending church. And he said, and we're worried about it for many different religions and denominations and whether it's your mosque or your temple or your, um, you know, wherever it is that you are going, we feel strongly that you going to your place of, of, of faith is important for all of us, that when you strengthen your faith, you strengthen ours as well. Um, I've always been a fan of Christo Stendhal's, um, which then this is, this is quoted so much among, um, among my, my uh, LDS friends. Um, we love this idea of holy envy. Um, it just happened to be really easy for me when I was growing up to feel a lot of that. I, I, I joke with my friends that I don't know what an, an LDS sacrament meeting smells like, but I know exactly what a Catholic mass smells like because of the incense. And I find that to be really compelling and beautiful. Whereas, you know, for us, it smells like a vacuum chapel, um, clean, but not particularly evocative, right? And, and I find that that is something that I can look at and go, I like that. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, the other thing that I would say too, is I think as I look at the political battles that are kind of fraying our, our, you know, our unity at the edges, you know, in the past, it was kind of always understood, but we're Americans first. And that doesn't just that, that that doesn't mean in an exclusionary way. It means that we have common values that are building upon, you know, we are we are trying to figure this out. And and, and to be clear, we've had a civil war, so I'm not trying to, to to make this look like everything was always peachy keen in the past. But we, we there, when we are functioning well, it's because we understand that um, we may not always agree, and yet that there are things that bind us together that are more important than the things that are trying to divide us. Um, I recently told a friend that I feel like we've all been put into a, a centrifuge and we're spinning very, very fast. Um, and the way to, to slow things down and come back together is to realize what binds us together um, and what, what holds us kind of uh, close to each other. It's, it's interesting that the centrifuge separates blood into its constituent parts. And you see this effect so strongly right now, even in communities, even in families, if I can be frank, whether it's, you know, um, masks and vaccines or LGBTQ issues or, or whatever it may be. Um, and I think, I think asking some hard questions about how can, we, how can we tap the brakes? How can we come back together? How can we see what's in common amongst us? Um, I, I, I remember hearing, I'm sorry, you've asked me a really interesting question. So I'm just going and going and going. I'll shut up in a second. But um, I remember hearing once that if you, if you want to have a friend, um, share something you have in common. And if you want to have a convert, share something you have that's different. And I found that to be really interesting. And now as I look at, at Twitter, it sounds like the only thing we're really interested in converts. I'm oh, sorry, the only thing we're really interested in is, is, is in making converts. We're not actually interested in friends right now. We're not interested in seeing the other side. Um, so I, I also don't find it to be particularly hard to say, I'm interested in both. I, I think I'm a genius when it comes to every world issue that is in front of us, right? I've, I've got it all figured out. So let me convince you. Um, but it doesn't take away one ounce of me thinking that I'm right to say, and I would love to hear what you think. And I would love to have you add to what I think so that I can understand it a little bit better. So um, anyway, those are my thoughts, not in brief at all. Those are my thoughts in long uh, about, about covenantal pluralism and how I really think it is at the core of this civility project that I'm, I'm trying to take on. Oh, I love that. I lo and you can see, I, now the world can see why I am such a fan of yours because I love your approach and I love how thoughtful you are about it. And I, I think you're exactly right. And it, just to add on to this, um, we all want converts because I think that's true. The, the way to, and Arthur Brooks talked about this first. So this is all Arthur Brooks and I just, I love him. The way to convince someone of something is to listen to them. And isn't that counterintuitive, but it's actually true. But the, the secret is that in the, in the listening and the changing of someone else's heart and mind, your own heart and mind will be changed as well. So what I say is make a friend that's very different from you and listen with curiosity and compassion and you, you'll change that person, but you will, you will be changed as well and the world will be changed as well. I think that's fantastic. I remember, I remember there was a quote by, as soon as you, you said Arthur Brooks, I knew that we were in a good place. Um, I, I, his, his briefcase story at BYU is a classic that is told right. now everywhere, right? We just love that. But um, there's another one that, that, uh, that he said recently that has kind of been my, my rallying cry, which is, it is not that we need to disagree less, it is that we need to disagree better. Um, 
Absolutely. And, uh, it's funny, a, a friend of mine on, on Twitter, this last weekend was a fabulous conference and we heard about avoiding contention and being more Christ-like and things that I, I feel very strongly about. Um, and one of my good friends said, you know, I'm going to be more kind and I'm going to engage less. And I thought, no, 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 no. You're the, you're the best. Like you are, you are exactly what the world needs. Don't, don't pull back, right? Recognize that maybe you are exactly the person who is, who the world is looking to hear the voice of, right? Um, and to be clear, if you feel like the Lord is pushing you to, to, to scale back, I respect that. And I, I recognize that that's a holy thing. Um, and at the same time, recognize that I, I, when I was growing up, my, my dad was a mission president. He was, a, he was the head of a group of missionaries for you know, 100, 150 missionaries. Um, and, and he said, the hardest kind of talk to give is the obedience talk. And I said, oh, that's funny. Why is that? And he said, because the people, the missionaries who need to hear the obedience talk are not the ones who hear it. And the ones who don't need to hear it are the, the missionaries who are already being as obedient as they possibly can be are the ones who go, oh, we need to be even more obedient, you know, and they, they, they pressure themselves and it's perfectionism and it's no bueno. And then the missionaries who are being disobedient aren't the ones listening to the talk anyway, right? <laughs> um, and I've, I've always kind of laughed at that because it's this, it's this difficult trade-off where you have to have some wisdom and you have to say, first of all, we all have to start with Lord, is it I? Is there something I can do? And at the same time, we need to recognize that we need people making mistakes, trying their best to. We need people being imperfect, but saying, I am trying to do the best I can, even though it's not always going to work. Um, and so I, anyway, I, I appreciate that. That was interesting to me. Yeah. Oh, I love that. No, I love that story. <laughs> well, fantastic. Is, is there anything else on your mind that you wanted to ask real quick? Well, I am now fascinated by your writing and by your podcast. And where can I find more of, of the wisdom you've put into the world? Well, you're very kind. And I, I was going to say earlier, you, you said that somebody suggested that you consider the ministry because you had the gifts and that is absolutely spot on. Um, so I, I am now partnering with Public Square Magazine. Um, I, uh, I have loved my association with them. They've become good friends. And they have decided to carry my podcast on their front page. So you should be able to see it there, um, which is really exciting. I was, I was telling you before we started recording, I, I, I apologize that this, that, you know, two months ago, this was just me recording in my, in my front office. And now it's a real podcast with, with guests that are, you know, saying useful things, you know, <laughs> these aren't just my childhood friends and it's, 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 it's kind of overwhelming, but um, I, uh, my podcast is, is hosted there. You can also follow it on YouTube. Um, I have found, we were, we were talking about um, uh, anonymous identities earlier, and I have found um, Elder Cook, one of the apostles in, in, my, in my faith, um, has encouraged us to do away with anonymous accounts um, and to avoid that mask of anonymity. And I've been pushing that a, a little bit lately. And I, I kind of liken it to being in, in, in university classes and having your camera off while you're in Zoom. Um, you might think that you'll act the same, but I promise you, you don't actually act the same over the long term. Um, anyway, my podcast can be found anywhere where you find podcasts. It's called Radical Civility. It's also on YouTube. And I find that having it on YouTube helps me to, you know, take it seriously and to, and to dress up and to have my camera on, so to speak. And so that's been, that's been pretty good too. Well, this has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for joining me. And I, I look forward to, uh, to talking more with you. Today.